Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear us and see us. Thank you so much for joining. This is the Chamber of Progress um, press briefing. Uh, I am Jess Myers. I'm Legal Advocacy Counsel at Chamber of Progress. Just very quickly, Chamber of Progress is a center-left tech industry policy coalition promoting technology's progressive future. We work to ensure that all Americans benefit from technological leaps and that the tech industry operates responsibly and fairly. Um, I'm joined here with Kathy Gellis and our other excellent panelists, um, Professor Eric Goldman and Corbin Barthold from uh, uh, Tech Freedom. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kathy. We're just going to do quick introductions, then we'll do key insights, and then we're going to turn it over to the room for your questions. Thanks for having me, Jess. Um, my name is Kathy Gellis. I'm an independent attorney in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I wrote an amicus brief in this case, in this case for an individual who runs a Mastodon server engine advocacy, which advocates for uh, startup companies, and the Copia Institute, which publishes TechDirt, an online news and uh, uh, outlet about uh, tech law policy and other developments in that space. Corbin, I'll kick it over to you. Hello, I am Corbin Barthold, Internet Policy Counsel at Tech Freedom. I live tweeted the oral argument, so if you want my impressions uh, as it happened, you can go find my Twitter account, and that's uh, over there. Excellent. Thank you. And Professor Goldman? Uh, yeah, hi. Eric Goldman from Santa Clara University School of Law. I hold several titles. You free, feel free to use one or more. I'm a professor of law. I'm associate dean for research and co-director of the High Tech Law Institute. And I filed an amicus brief in this case uh, in support of Google uh, regarding the interplay between the First Amendment and Section 230. Excellent. Thank you to the speakers who are here today. Thank you to all of the folks who are on the call asking excellent questions. Um, you know, Kathy and I, we just came from the court ourselves and we have a lot to discuss and dive into. So really looking forward to hearing your questions. Um, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna ask each of the speakers to sort of give their two sentence hot take on what just went down about an hour ago. So I'll go ahead and start, I'm playing moderator and speaker. Um, so I'll just start by saying, I'm feeling more optimistic than I was when I you know, walked into the courtroom this morning. Um, it was clear to me that the justices appreciate how important it is to get this right. Uh, specifically, the court seemed to appreciate that algorithms and content moderation are essential to the way the internet functions today, and that any attempts to create imprecise legal and technological distinctions could have irreparable effects on the modern web. I would add that um, we had a lot of apprehension going in because based on some um, concurrences and dissents, we were alarmed by the understanding that various justices had about Section 230 and how it worked and why it was important. And it would appear that if nothing else, amicus counsel, not just myself, but my other colleagues may have saved the day because it was evident that the justices took a lot of those lessons on board. And it appeared overall that there was not a huge appetite to upend the internet, especially on a case that I believe to them looked rather weak from a, a point of point of view. Corbin? Yeah, pretty similar to Kathy's comments. My, my two headline concerns were, uh, will the justices drift off into all kinds of other cases, taking stuff down under C2 or distributor versus publisher liability? And on the whole, they did not, which I am pleased about. And would the United States and or the petitioners be able to draw the line that they need to draw between recommendations and presentation? And I didn't see a line, a workable line in the briefs, and I didn't hear a line in the argument. And I think the justices were very explicit that they did not hear a line. Professor Goldman? Um, I agree with my uh, colleagues uh, that um, I didn't hear five votes in support of the petitioner's position. So I think uh, as a matter of the votes, there's some reason to be optimistic that Google will likely uh, prevail. Um, having said that, um, there's still a lot of crossover between this case and the Tamna case that will be argued tomorrow. And it's possible that things in that case will affect this case in ways that I can't quite predict yet but don't give me complete comfort that we've heard the whole story from the Supreme Court. In addition, even if Google wins the case, I remain nervous based on the tenor of the questions today that there's a number of ways in which the opinion or opinions could be caveated or otherwise qualified in ways that would open up the door for lower courts 
and plaintiffs to look for other opportunities to undo Section 230's basic community structure. Um, so I'm more optimistic about the outcome of this case than I was before the oral arguments, but I'm not much more optimistic about the fate of Section 230. I remain petrified that the opinion is going to put um, all of us in an unexpected circumstance. Agreed. I echo everything that all of my colleagues here said as well. Um, with that, I, we have questions that we got on the back burner, but I really wanted to spend most of the time opening it up to the room for questions. So uh, I'll go ahead and start there. Anyone, if you have a want to raise a hand or if you want to just go off mute and, and ask your question, please feel free. Looks like we might have someone. Yes, Chris Terry. All right, here, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I was having a little auto trouble there. Um, I enjoyed all of your presentations today and thank you for this panel. Um, I'm curious who you think writes the opinion and what you think if Justice Jackson writes it. I can't imagine that Justice Jackson will be the justice to write it. I don't think she would be interested in stepping up to it. And I don't think other than she's new on the court and needs something to write this term. I, I think other people have other things to say. Um, I think I might guess perhaps Kagan um, and if not Kagan, possibly Kavanaugh um, because I, and actually possibly more Kavanaugh because I think he had been some of the, one of the justices that had some commentary earlier about not understanding necessarily how section 230 operated and i think he gets it now and seem to have a good a reasonably good grasp of the interplay of what is at stake uh with the the on uh, the flood of litigation that would follow and a little bit of the interplay in terms of why we have it and what kinds of space we're really trying to afford to the platform so that they can be free to be available to facilitate content and moderate content um i've can't believe I'm necessarily saying this, but I think actually it might be a good decision if he wrote it um, and he seemed to have things to say. So that would be maybe my guess. And also I think Justice Kagan also saw some of those interest issues the same way and also Justice Roberts. But then I think we're looking into the math of who writes which decisions for, for this term. Yeah, I was impressed with how much the court, uh, at least when it came to Kavanaugh, uh, how much they they sort of relied on some of the economic impact arguments as well. And it seemed that they appreciated that too. So I, I echo everything you said. Uh, Professor Goldman or Corbin, any any other thoughts on that question? Uh, just quickly, I'll add, um, it wouldn't surprise me if there's going to be more than one opinion. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if Gorsuch and uh, Jackson each write their own opinion. They were definitely marching to a different drummer, I think, than their colleagues. Um, and uh, it's also possible, I think, that in the debrief from the arguments, uh, Justice Jackson will start to see some of the merits of the uh, of the positions of her colleagues. I would throw Justice Sotomayor in as well as a candidate for a separate opinion, somebody who was kind of testing lines of thought that other justices weren't um, Justice Jackson, I would warn, you know, there is a such thing as justices just testing uh, positions in oral argument to make sure that they understand things right. And she is not obligated to believe things in exactly the way she says it. So I, you know, I would just flag that uh, what happens in oral argument does not necessarily track what happens with uh, the actual opinions. Um, if just if Chief Justice Roberts decides that he's in the majority, he gets to assign the opinion. I could see him taking this and trying to find a very narrow workmanlike decision that decides things on the facts and tosses it back without saying much more. Maybe that's just me and my 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 hopes for it. Um, but this is a very high profile case, and Chief Justice Roberts tends to write. Uh, slightly fewer opinions than his colleagues, and he has a tendency to kind of pluck up the really big ones. So I could see him doing it. Actually, if I can add to that, um, Justice Roberts wrote the decision in the Bostock case, which was a statutory interpretation case. And this case is all about statutory interpretation. Um, it, he, it, Justice Gorsuch? No, I, I thought it was uh, Roberts. So, uh, Jess, I see a question in the 
chat. I don't know if you want to take that one. Yes, let's let's go ahead and jump to that question. So there's a, a good question in the chat. Does the Gonzalez plaintiffs' constant shifting of their arguments count against them with SCOTUS, or does that not matter? Um, this was a question that I also had throughout. It, not only have we now seen the petitioners change their question from the cert brief to their merits, but we even saw in the, it, it, we heard in the oral arguments today, um, they threw out sort of the, their discussion regarding URLs, for example, when it comes to when uh, uh, Google would be converted to an information content provider. And they switched to this thumbnail discussion that I don't think we, we saw discussed um, in their complaint or in any of their briefs, briefs either. So I'm actually left with the same question. What happens here? I think the justices were also, I think Sotomayor, she had, she had pointed out um, there was a little bit of confusion between, you know, which lines of questioning are, are we actually, are you actually presenting to us today? Um, so I'm going to turn it actually to my co-panelists. If anyone has some thoughts on, on what, what happens here? I mean, go ahead. Okay. Um, there's always the possibility, and they might decide that this is usable, that they could just say there's a technical foul on the, the change of position. This is, this whole case has been improvidently, improvidently granted and, um, use that as kind of a get out of having to do anything that might make a mess free. And given that I think there's a desire not to make a mess that could have some appeal. But the fact that we've gone this far, there's been all these briefs and the fact that um, now we've heard the argument and they spent three hours on it, they may want to actually produce a decision. So I sort of feel like the procedural, there, there won't be necessarily a hand slap uh, procedurally, but effectively it meant that they kept asking the question, let me make sure I understand your argument. This is not a particularly good sign that their argument was holding sway because I think to some extent they didn't understand. And it was, I think, a very polite justice way of saying what you are telling us doesn't make sense. And if it doesn't make sense, how can we possibly find in your favor? So it isn't a question of, is it allowed or poor form for SCOTUS? It's just not necessarily effective advocacy. Corbin, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, so I had raised in some of my earlier commentary before the argument the possibility that, you know, you change the question presented, you really are inviting the possibility of a dig, a dismissed as improvidently granted. I agree that that is probably not going to happen here, but I just wanted to add on that not only did they change the question presented, the petitioners from the petition to the brief, but in their reply brief, they then said, so let me set this up just very quickly. The, the question presented in the petition is, our recommendations, algorithmic recommendations protected by 230. They then in the brief say, under what circumstances are they protected? And then by the time we get to their reply brief, they say, quote, the court should not undertake to fashion a special legal rule about recommendations as such. And then that Mr. Schnapper made basically that line in his uh, opening monologue during the argument. That's how much they have shifted their arguments and I agree that even if it doesn't result in a dig, uh, it does It does matter. It makes it very hard for the justices to rule in your favor. And sometimes what you'll see is the justices, they want to rule in your favor, so they start kind of crafting your argument for you in the oral argument because they have their own thoughts about how you should win. I saw none of that in this argument. I saw no ability of the justices to step in and kind of do the petitioner's work for them at all. Uh, Jess, if I could just add one other point that isn't directly in response to the question, but it was clear that this case never should have been granted certiorari. This was not a good case to go up to the Supreme Court because there wasn't a circuit split that the court was responding to. And these plaintiffs' arguments were simply not strong enough to be able to carry the, the day on their own. And so I feel like I, a lot of the justices are probably saying, this this we shouldn't even be hearing this case these arguments are not strong enough to warrant our time surprisingly i think justice thomas would actually agree with you the one who we all thought would be the most eager to hear this case it seemed right out of the gate he was wondering why is this in my courtroom okay um i'm actually going to go to uh shannon do we have who, I, I assume you're teeing up here yep let's do abby robertson question next in the chat excellent um uh, so Amy Go Coney Barrett raised the possibility of ruling on Tamna without dealing with Section 230. I'm curious if you think there's any appetite for that on the court. Kathy, you and I were just talking about this. I'll turn it to you. Um, I think I, I may be out of step with some of my other co-panelists, but my view is if they can't find a cause of action that's enforceable for on Tamna, like a direct one, then I think that does kind of give them another bailout option to not have to touch Section 230. 
because the liability wouldn't get there. There's no liability that could attach. So why are we going to risk breaking the internet off of a claim that's not meritorious? Um, the response that the petitioners gave was that the cases aren't completely analogous and they're not also at the same procedural stage, which then he said, well, you know, what happens on Tamna doesn't necessarily speak to what would happen here because we would have the opportunity to replead. That may be a compelling argument uh, against it, but I think, you know, if we're, if our optimism isn't misplaced, that the court doesn't have an, uh, an appetite to upend the internet and touch section 230, this may be a vector where they can use the decision in town to avoid it. Yeah, it seemed like that line of questioning from the ACB uh, was sort of signaling that's exactly where they were wanting to go with it. Plus, I mean, we heard from the justices repeatedly, isn't this a problem for Congress, not for us to reinterpret Section 230? So I think if they'd rather not touch it, they that if they not touch it, they'd rather not. Um, any other thoughts from a co-panelist? Yeah, I would just add that in seeing Barrett say that and Kavanaugh bring up Congress, you are seeing the justices that are currently sort of the middle of the court a little bit, which suggests they might be able to sway things. And some of the platforms ask for exactly that result. Please rule on Tom Day and send the rest back down, which might be a small factor. Okay, where are we on there, Corey? Oh, actually, if I can just add one footnote to that, um, going back to Sotomayor, because we also addressed whether she would write a separate opinion. I believe it was Justice Sotomayor who said, I'm going to be looking at your complaint closely and wanting to make sure that any argument you made at an appellate context actually matches to what you pledged. So I can also see that that may also provide, especially hooked up together with town, that may also provide an avenue to avoid doing anything on the 230 front. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to move to our next question. Um, were you surprised by Thomas's seeming support for Google, given his seeming support for platforms being common carriers? Um, I, I think I addressed this at the uh, at the last question. I was most surprised by Justice Thomas. I think uh, out of everything that we we heard today, I think his reaction right out the gate at the very beginning was was most surprising to me. I, I think that this was not the case that he thought it was going to be. And again, I think that can be attributed to how much the question has changed and, and how much uh, delta we have between uh, the uh, cert and, and the merit briefs, as uh, Corbin pointed out. But other thoughts? You know, each of the justices has a different question style, and we've learned more about it since they started doing a little more of the seriatim uh, format. So Chief Justice Roberts, I've generally found, fine. He really cuts to the core of the issue with his first question for each side, and that's his style. Justice Thomas, even today, we have sort of less understanding of what his questions do and what they mean than of any of the other justices. As many people probably know, he used to ask no questions for a very long time. So I would just warn, my personal view is that he, perhaps of all the justices, we get the least insight of where he might actually go based on his questions you know he we i i wouldn't read too much in i look, i'll put it this way his past written opinions are probably more reliable as to where his head is than what questions he asked today i think he's an intellectualist and he likes to engage very seriously with a balanced question and come up with something that is has sustainable doctrine behind it we may disagree with whether it's sustainable or a good doctrine, but I think he's very serious in how he engages with it. And now that we're hearing his questions, he's been tossing out some particularly interesting hypos, some of the most interesting and entertaining, engaging, but not, not superficial hypos in a number of cases that have had First Amendment issues, because I think that's the thing that he cares about. And he's trying to build the sustainable Thomas doctrine on the First Amendment front. And I think there was some disappointment, maybe it's disappointment, but I don't think he thought that this case was going to help him build the doctrine he's been trying to build towards. Um, it didn't give him any fodder for it and possibly might have nudged, we can always hope, it may have nudged him in another direction by providing an enormous opportunity for Amiki to educate the court. Um, because even those concurrences that were, or the, the supporting opinions that we're worried about were supporting opinions where there wasn't an understanding of the issues at stake. And now there's been a gazillion amicus briefs to sort of help shape that. Um, 
I think he wanted to entertain with a seriously robust issue doctrinally and did not find a there there that could sustain that kind of inquiry. And I think that's probably why we're bullish on his vote, not being in favor of the petitioners. All right, we'll move to the next question. Um, there was a lot of concern, it seemed, about extending liability against neutral tools. Would that be a way the court might cabin 230 immunity? That is, plaintiffs could state a claim if they can show that some non-neutral entity uh, performed the recommendation. Yeah, I think this is this is a really good question. I think the way I was, and honestly, this is probably the issue that has me the most concerned today. Uh, there seemed to be a lot of discussion around, well, if the algorithm is designed neutrally, if it's applied neutrally, if some the person on the other end who is implementing it is, is applied neutrally, then actually they should be protected by Section 230. Now, in this case, I, you know, I, I think it makes sense for the justices to go down that road to try to reason with, you know, the, the, the first question that Justice Thomas put out there, what is the difference between YouTube um, recommending cooking videos versus ISIS content? I think in, in that way, yes, it, it operates neutrally, but I would be very concerned to see a sort of outcome that says uh, if, if a service does not implement neutral algorithms and they are not eligible for Section 230, I think that would be kind of a disastrous result. And I don't recall which justice said it, but um, pointed out a, a super good point, which is what does neutral even mean when we're talking about um, the design and implementation of algorithms? I mean, any time a service makes a decision, whether that's manually or with you know through technology via an algorithm, uh, they are displaying some sort of bias. When they leave content up, that is them making an affirmative choice to um, uh, say that they want to carry that content versus when they deprioritize content. Um, that's very similar in 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 some ways of you know, of removing that content or making it not visible to uh, uh, the audiences that they they cater to. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was question. Justice Gorsuch, and I was really pleased. Yeah. I thought Lisa Blatt, perhaps her finest moment was when Justice Alito asked her about intentional knowing of a defamatory statement, and she went straight to what I thought was the right place. She said, "Think of Yelp, you know, Yelp." and Glassdoor are very valuable services, and it would be very hard to draw that neutral line for a website that is intentionally welcoming uh, employer reviews, some of which you know are going to be highly negative and employers, it's gonna draw their ire. Um, so hopefully they they heard her answer because I thought it was a good one. Um, if I can just add, um, this is a good example of where an opinion could go wrong even if Google wins. If the court says, that Section 230 is only available if the service is using neutral tools or neutral algorithms or any of the other things that, that basically conflict with the basic publication process. Um, plaintiffs are going to look for the opportunity to say, I either can show that the tool's not neutral because bad empirics or ad hoc data, or give me the chance to go and uh, into discovery and I'll go find that uh, evidence. So. Um, when I heard all the discussion about neutral tools and neutral algorithms, and there was one time referencing neutral rules, and there was one time talking about algorithms that don't discriminate, all of that was, I think, very fertile ground for an opinion that actually plaintiffs are going to like more than, um, than uh, they like the outcome in this case. I think my optimism for this case is that that area, I agree with Eric, there be dragons there. But the my takeaway is I think the justices understand that. And especially if this case itself makes them queasy, I hope they can connect the dots between this is a queasy case and it is really easy for us to upend the apple cart. And we, and we did hear from various justices that lack of appetite to upend the apple cart, where if there is an issue, it is an issue that goes back to Congress. So I'm hoping that might temper the, uh, the dicta language that they might otherwise do. I mean, there was a great deal of struggle of, here's some edge cases that seem really hard. What kind of test can you give us that would scale to them? And we didn't necessarily resolve on anything that completely worked, although there may be some good stuff in amicus briefs. Um, that may hopefully be enough, but I'm maybe the, the, the difficulty in arriving at that answer hopefully will steer them to maybe not try to come up with one, at least not off the facts of this case. Agreed. I'll just add, you know, piggybacking off of Professor Goldman's point as well. I think the thing that has me the most concerned about the neutral tools discussion is actually all of these social media addiction cases that are sort of waiting in the wings. 
Um, we've already seen this line of argument before with dangerous design, addictive, addictive design. Well, this is exactly where they're going to go. They're going to point to, they're going to plead their claims as a neutral tools uh, or non-neutral tools claim. Um, all right, so we've got 10 questions. Uh, we're going to move a little bit quicker as we go through here. Um, I'm going to actually, I think we answered the question about um, neutral tools. So I'm going to pivot. Uh, does the conservative majority care more about net choice than the safe harbor? And do you think that will influence their decision here, i.e. easier to justify forcing platforms to carry all speech if they have robust CDA immunity? Professor Golden, I'm going to turn this to you. I mean, you, you made a face like you wanted to say something. Just no, now. I'm actually I'm confused by the question. I'm trying to find it. Okay. Um, so either can you summarize the question one more time um, or maybe somebody else can go first? I was, I'm going in very optimistic mood where I think we will get a Google win and hopefully a decision that does not do something terrible. And if I want to even double down on that some more, I think one of the huge upsides to this case and the weird fire drill that it presented, especially to Amiki supporting Section 230 and Google, is it gave us an opportunity to educate the court in particular on issues that relate to net choice. Now, one thing in particular, I thought it was conspicuous the way that oral argument did not very strongly engage with the First Amendment issues at stake with platform moderation, possibly to the detriment, but maybe it was a strategic decision that just focus on Section 230, because if that goes off the rails, then now you've got a problem. And we were expecting an unfriendly court potentially to look at the First Amendment issues involved with platform moderation. So I could see that the case might have been mooted with the idea of we steer clear for that. But it turns out, I think bringing in the First Amendment to the discussion might have answered some of the Section 230 questions, particularly some that came up at the end. But I was impressed. And I keep going back to Kavanaugh. And he's stuck in my head. Um, but even some of the other conservative justices and even some of the liberal justices who sort of understood that how can you have a rule because everything is subjective. Platform moderation is not an objective thing. Um, there's always going to be decisions being made, and that was a theme that kept getting returned to. Somebody is having to decide. And if you have somebody deciding, then you have to afford the freedom to decide. And net choice is all about the freedom to decide. Plus, net choice is also about a preemption problem, which is not necessarily queued up on the CERT, but it's part of the underlying problem of each state now attempting to set up its own rules. And this oral argument did address what happens when there's not preemption and every state can essentially come up with their own tort law and recharacterize claims however they want in order to create uh, liability on platforms to drive them to behave in certain ways. And it seemed like overall there was traction among the justices to say that might be a bad thing. It turns out it may also be an unconstitutional thing. That dot has yet to be unequivocally connected for them, but I think there might be some intuition that there is a First Amendment implication. And so that's uh, why I'm more optimistic that um, this case may have presented an opportunity to hopefully uh, get where we need to go on those net choice cases. Yeah, so I don't know if I saw anything direct about net choice, but it is absolutely true that the scope of 230 impacts the scope of those state law cases because you have the supremacy clause out there, whether the states like it or not. Um, so a broader reading of Section 230 is de facto a narrower reading of those state laws. One of the craziest ways that things could have gone off the rails today that, you know, was in my nightmares was if somebody started asking about, you know, some of these theories that Texas comes up with of, well, is there an unconstitutional condition in here somewhere or some kind of unconstitutional speaker-based distinction? We didn't see any of that. I think we saw total comfort with the notion that Section 230 um, applies as a lot of us thought it did, and that would uh, go a long way toward addressing the net choice cases, even if not via the First Amendment issues that are currently up on appeal. It would be a major limiting principle on those state laws. Ironically, the justice that sort of left the most leeway for a potential narrowing of Section 230 that could give those state laws play was Justice Jackson. Um, if I can just add a couple things, uh, we didn't hear the First Amendment really come up in oral arguments, and I think that's appropriate. This was a statutory interpretation question. Uh, tomorrow's case will involve a prima facie elements question. Um, and so, uh, you know, 
I think that um, a lot of the discussion was informed by the fact that this was looking at the scope of what Congress said and what Congress would be free to change over time. Um, I think that the net choice cases raise square First Amendment questions where I think the, the stakes will be higher for the justices because of the fact that if they opine on the First Amendment, that's something the legislature can't override. They can't fix it. Um, they're simply going to be stuck. Um, so I don't really see a lot of trade off yet between the net choice cases and these uh, two cases, because they're just going to be asking different questions of the court. And I don't think we got any predictive insight into the net choice cases because of the First Amendment defenses that are play there that are just, they weren't relevant to today's conversation. I'll just add, um, by the way, I think we need all four of them. Uh, if we're going to absolutely protect the internet and user generated content, we need Gonzalez, Tamina, and the two net choice cases. I say two, we're still waiting to hear on Texas, obviously, but we need all four of them if we're going to uh, robustly protect uh, uh, online speech. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question here. Hi, Professor Goldman. In your quick debrief on your blog, you mentioned your concerns about Blatt's endorsement of the Henderson test. Can you talk more about that? And Neil actually asked the same question, so we'll just go ahead and, and address that. A good example of how great minds think alike. Um, so um, in uh, uh, earlier, uh, I'm sorry, uh, last year, uh, the Fourth Circuit issued a, a really sweeping Section 230 ruling uh, in Henderson, of, um, in the Henderson case. And um, the most important thing to take away from that case, although there are many ways that case went wrong, is that the court said that you could only base a Section 230 defense if the actual content itself was the source of the harm. Any other claim that might be based on third-party content that didn't tie to the content itself um, uh, was would wouldn't would have worked. Um, and that's just not even in the statute. The the um, uh, the Fourth Circuit just literally made up that extra requirement that the harm be in the content itself, as opposed to trying to hold the third party uh, uh, the the service liable for third party content. Um, and by inverting the elements of that, um, it actually substantially narrowed uh, the scope of the opinion. Um, I'm sorry, the scope of uh, uh, Section two thirty, and it overrode one of the best, most defense favorable Section 230 opinions, the Zaran case, also from the Fourth Circuit, which had a different ruling that I think was implicitly um, uh, overwritten by uh, Henderson. So it was shocking to me to see Google endorse the Henderson opinion because it is a dramatic narrowing of Section 230. And to the extent that the Supreme Court takes that bait and says, Henderson's good to Google, it's good to us, um, we'll actually see a dramatic narrowing of um, uh, Section 230, where plaintiffs will find lots of other opportunities to uh, to bring cases that are based on third-party content. They'll just say that they're based on something other than the harm that was in the third-party content itself. And that, um, uh, uh, unfortunately, was a lot of where the riffing was on things like the employment discrimination questions that kept on coming up um, in the oral arguments. This idea that... Um, uh, that there are decisions that a service makes that have nothing to do with Section 230. Um, and I think everyone agrees with that. But then saying that that lots of things that involve the publication of third-party content are really about the, the, the publisher's first-party choices, that's actually the big trap that we've been trying to avoid. The Henderson opinion keys that up for us. Uh, very troubling uh, admission by uh, Google's lawyer. I think what, um, what she wanted from it logically she ended up ratifying more than was advisable. I think she was looking for a way that people were talking about, there were some on the edge hypos with like the, the discrimination and the matching type thing. And so how do you find where, where's that line between um, the, mag the, the sorting magic that is happening behind the scenes? When is that covered by 230 and when is that not covered by 230? And I think she was finding some utility coming from Henderson, but by endorsing it this broadly, it endorsed probably more than we were bargaining for and certainly more than necessarily Amiki would have signed up, signed on for. Like Amiki were also proposing alternate tests and this and the other thing. And I think that's why the judge, the justices were a little bit surprised. Like, are you sure? Is that really what you want? Um, because it did seem to be like, you might not need to say that to win this case, um, but I think I think she was so focused on what that logical utility was to make that distinction 
that it just ended up being a slightly over enthusiastic or possibly a drastically over enthusiastic endorsement of that particular case. That's exactly where I landed as well. I just figured she was, it, it was sort of an overzealous hope to, to show some sort of limit to Section 230, show uh, some sort of technological limit when it comes to um, bias algorithms as well. Um, but I, I agree, I thought that was the, the a little too much, wrong case to do it. Um, I was also personally surprised that we didn't hear roommates come up at all. I thought, you know, the material contribution discussion might have been a little bit easier to have than um, Henderson, but I also, I, I suspect roommates didn't come up because there was a lot more focus on the actual statutory uh, text of Section 230, so. Um, just just to clarify, the neutral tools discussion did come out of roommates.com, even if it wasn't yeah. expressly referenced. Um, but I agree with you that the roommates.com had other utility that could have been mined. They didn't. That's OK. And in fact, as you saw, Justice Gorsuch was gunning for um, the roommates.com opinion. So I don't know uh, if uh, he'll be able to make any progress in trying to change their rules. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree on the neutral tools aspect. I think I was more looking for a, a express discussion of um, when a service materially contributes to uh, the the illegality of, of the content. And, you know, we had a lot of opportunities to or, or Google had a lot of opportunities to to, to point that out, um, to point out those limits. And I think they sort of missed on 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 those points. Um, OK, moving through the next ones, I'm going to skip through some of these neutral algorithms ones that I think we've covered those sure neutral algorithm is a neutral algorithm with neutral well hate speech or any kind of discrimination i don't know do we want to take i think let's let's keep going through some of these because i think we've answered a lot of the neutral tools bias. i think these questions are echoing what the justices questions were about what is an algorithm and do we have any plausible expectation of neutrality and i think the answer kept coming back to no somebody is deciding and there's always some value judgment um, being you know leveraged on the scale um and then the question i think that gorsuch queued up is okay but then what and i think the answer and this is probably why i was thinking like there was a broader first amendment question is so what is it doesn't matter of course somebody is going to decide and they're able to decide because the first amendment protects that but functionally section 230 also protects it to make sure that moderation decisions can happen and there was some reference i believe in the argument about moderation and in inherently is connected to sorting that you really can't uh, separate these two functions as oh you've hosted it so therefore you've not made any sort of uh, recommendation or suggesting or some sort of some sort of decision that's going to affect the display because the act of displaying user content is affecting the display of the content whether you just can't avoid it and uh i think we answered that a number of times in the oral argument coming at it in different ways but i don't know if we did so unequivocally with one chorus of voices where it was all clear but it kept getting hit up um, our next question we have, can you lay out some of the more probable or possible specifics of the sort of throat clearing and an opinion about the Gonzalez or Tamina cases that could be consequential for 230, even if the court ends up deciding in favor of Google? So I think this is uh, getting to the point that Professor Goldman made, which is, you know, it's not enough for Google to just win here. We need a full-throated support of Section 230 as well. Um, I will just add, I think we've, we've discussed this um, extensively, but um, I'll just note Every time, I, I think it was Lisa Blatt that, that made this argument, but every every time we chip the Section 230C1 immunity, it becomes less effective to the point where it's probably not even worth using it as a defense. And so I think, again, if we if the justices decide to go down this sort of neutral tools discussion or they try to distinguish between um, when Section 230 applies to recommendations versus algorithmic recommendations, or even if they go down the traditional editorial function route, um, what is a publisher claim, for example, um, all of those are opportunities to uh chip section 230 c1 um uh shield if you will um uh which would make it i think effectively useless depending on on you know the where the court takes it if it's conditional it's no longer useful because you're going to be litigating over whether it applies i think justice kavanaugh and justice kagan at minimum understood this um and so i'm hoping that understanding can help minimize the dicta because then there was also language where I really like that Bostock case, and I use it in, in Section 230 briefs all the time, because in that case, the court wrote a decision to say, we may not like the policy effects, but this was Congress's job, and they got what they wrote, and it's not our job to change it. 
And we heard some of the justices, I think Justice Kavanaugh talked today about, we may or may not like the policy, but it is not our job to fix it. As the, some justices were going back to, but we're a court, we're a court. If you don't like the policy that the statute delivers, go back to the place that wrote the statute in the first place. This isn't our job, because I think they also recognized if they broke something, how do you fix it? Because you'd have to go back to the legislature, but the legislature already spoke. So what do they say instead if they didn't get what they already said they wanted in the first place? And I think the only thing is some of the justices, I think, and maybe Justice Jackson in particular, was, well, did they mean to write a broad statute or did they mean to write a narrow statute? And if they wrote it 25 years ago, how could they have imagined it applied now? So it was more of a pure, Congress couldn't possibly have meant for it to apply here. So therefore, if we change it, we're not changing anything. But I think that's the minority view on, on the court. I think the court says they wrote a broad statute. They wrote something that would scale. I know they had amicus support for this idea. And um, it's not our job to change it because we can't clean up the mess if we do. There was also a further promising point, I thought. I think it was Justice Kavanaugh who, who kind of said, well, the statute was passed and then this consensus among the courts developed. And why should we disrupt that even as it stands now? And uh, Mr. Stewart basically said, well, all of those courts got it wrong. So let the heavens fall. And nobody seemed to have an appetite for that. So um, I agree that the Henderson discussion was not terribly helpful. Um, I will point out Google in their brief tried to make it sound like, well, there's no real difference, even if you do this weird theory of deriving the meaning of publication from defamation law, you end up at the same place. I think that is still throwing a hostage to fortune if they go down that route. Um, so my my one concern is that they'll kind of say we endorse the case law and then Henderson still gets to sneak in. That's That would be too bad. But um, but I did like that. I like the notion that maybe you'll get some opinion from Chief Justice Roberts saying, uh, whatever you take from this opinion, don't think it wants to disrupt the status quo. Okay, we're going to move into this last question here, um, and then I'm going to ask all of the speakers to sort of give their final thoughts. So, uh, Nicole asked, Justice Gorsuch and many amici kept emphasizing the importance of Section 230 F4's definition of access software provider rather than just C1. How relevant is F4 to the question, and how likely is it to play into uh, the court's reasoning? Um, just to connect a couple dots here backing up, um, access software provider uh, appears under 230F2 when it's defining interactive computer service. And I think where we see the amici and also the court reason when it comes when they're relying on the access software provider is when we're talking about uh, curation. So um, the selection, I believe it's uh, you know how they how they display, how they select, pick content. Um, those uh, operations are also protected as well by Section 230. But uh, as we sort of heard and as we've seen in the uh, petitioner's briefs, um, their argument is that when YouTube or whoever makes a recommendation, they are not doing sort of a curatorial operation as, as provided for in the access software uh, definition. Other thoughts? Yeah, uh, this line of cases is really underdeveloped. There have been other cases suggested that essentially websites uh, meet the statutory definition of access software provider and therefore get the benefits of uh, the protection for the verbs that are listed under that definition. Um, but those are, those are like an anomalous line of cases, um, because if that's true, you really don't need the rest of the statute because everything then becomes an access software provider. And that doesn't make any sense either. So I've always viewed the F4 discussion as really a distractor. Um, it's really not helpful to the conversation. I was disappointed to see some of the amici embrace it, because I feel like if you get the win today, you're going to regret it in the future when the rest of the statutory scheme collapses, because it just doesn't fit. It was, in fact, intended to cover just one type of um, activity that was really, in the old days, it was designed to be uh, the um, uh, browser add-ons or um, uh, uh, filtering software that was going to be uh, fed new uh, blocking uh, elements uh, from a central base. And so it was a very specific kind of thing that was uh, intended. And blowing it up to cover all the internet is is just not going to work. Um, so I'm hopeful that is a, a, an idiosyncratic thing to Justice Gorsuch. That might be why he decides to write his own opinion, because he really feels like this was the winning argument. 
I didn't hear a lot of enthusiasm from the other justices. I'm hopeful that means that that will be a one-off with him. Absolutely. Um, okay, we can go ahead and move into some final thoughts. Um, so, you know, I'll just say, uh, as we know, this is probably one of the biggest internet law cases we have seen in the past decades, one of the most important ones. Um, I feel a lot more optimistic, as, as I mentioned, I'm feeling a lot more op optimistic now than when I was heading into the room. Um, but I'll leave you all on, on this sort of note, which is that um, you know, Section 230 protections are essential for the modern web and eliminating those protections for algorithms, for non-neutral tools, bias, curation, um, it, it, it would disrupt the, you know, it would functionally eliminate all of Section 230's protections, um, you know, deprive the internet, deprive internet users of um, all the value that they get from social media, um, and it would disproportionately harm speakers uh, um, on society's margins as well. I think the issue with Section 230, for those of us who advocate for it so strongly, is because of the implications of if it went away and why we have those implications. And to have heard straight from several of the justices' mouth the term flood of litigation, I am hardened to hear that practical understanding of what Section 230 is there to do, where it's not about the winner or loser or something good or bad that happened in any particular situation, but whether we can have an ecosystem and a communications technology where you need to have the help of somebody to get other expression online and also to do the curation and moderation that makes it healthy and advisable and good for society. And if you do not have the safety available to protect the platforms to make it safe for them to do it, you've got a problem. And the justices who are able to articulate intuitively that you would have a problem with you just set up a lawsuit that this is not a minor thing. This is not something you can just snip at the corners and the edges and not have a huge effect on. That understanding of if you snip it a little bit, you basically gut it completely because it no longer functions as anything that a platform can count on to be able to engage in the business or the endeavor, the exercise of intermediating other people's expression. That's huge, that's critical. And I think my favorite thing for today, well, I'll just dream about and replay in my head was hearing the justices understand the civil procedure problem of what happens if Section 230 goes away. Uh, different tack on a very similar point. Uh, in individual litigation, as in public debate, often the loudest voices have a lot of room to run and very creative theories get thrown around and they start to get taken seriously. And then at some point, a judge, or in this case, the nine justices finally get to come in and have a word and sanity suddenly gets reimposed. So, well, you know, who knows some future case, maybe things will happen, but nobody was sitting there going, oh, you know, is there this distinction between a publisher and a platform or you know, some of these fallacies that as long as we're waiting to finally get a, a nine justice decision, lots and lots of people convince themselves are like these serious arguments. And then they they don't even make it in the room once the adults finally get to consider a concrete case. And I found that heartening. I love a lot of the comments of my uh, colleagues. Um, I do hate ending on a sour note, but I have to go there, um, which is uh, no matter what happens with this case, Section 230 remains highly imperiled. Um, whether it's a direct uh, hit, either in court um, or in Congress, um, uh, Section 230 is is uh, you know become the uh, the target for all of the pro censorship impulses that are across both parties and across a huge swath of American voters. Um, and even if Section 230 is reformed, if we can't fix some of the crazy things coming out of states, they're coming at the same basic issue. And it may or may not be possible to use either the First Amendment or Section 230 to fight all of the different ways that they're attacking the internet. So um, we today was a better day than I'd hoped, but I still remain very bearish on the future of use of generating content online because there are so many threats Everyone in the world thinks that they know how to do it better than uh, the existing players. Um, and those impulses lead to a, a, a slew of regulation that we simply can't defeat with any particular court ruling. 
And on that uh, cheery note, <laughs> we will go ahead and conclude this briefing. Thank you to the speakers again for joining us, for joining Chamber of Progress today. Um, thank you all to, uh, you know, showed up and asked excellent questions. Uh, and yeah, looking forward to discussing this case and, to, and tomorrow's as well uh, throughout the rest of the next few weeks. Thank you, Jess.